Hello, my juicy co-creators. Lilu here. I'm in England, in London, for another delicious interviews because there is so many beautiful spiritual goddesses here in the city. I love it. Hello, Davina. Hello, Lilu. Beautiful uh, to meet you. Yes, same for me, and to have this conversation because you have a very interesting background. She doesn't look like it, but she's a shaman. <laughs> I love the the the. Where where are the feathers? I know. I left them at home. I should have brought them for you, really, shouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> They don't travel well on the London tubes, I find. <laughs> <laughs> I love I, I I just love it that really uh, I get a kick out of that because sometimes we, we have an immediate judgment or we see something and then we have... But you are actually, you spent quite a, some time in Peru and you wrote uh, a, a book on um, on the dream. So you, you wrote the Dreams Whisperer a few years ago. But you're very much this shamanistic woman dealing with those, uh, you know, d helping us to live our highest potential. Mm -hmm. How do you see, how do you see this potential? How big is it? Well, our highest potential? I really think we are in the shift of the ages. I truly believe we are being asked to transcend our human consciousness and really become awakened and aware. So I think it's absolutely huge. Mm. And that's why it's tough at the moment. You know, for a lot of people, a lot of people are really experiencing issues in the planet, finding it quite hard to manage the day-to-day -day living because things are changing. The way we work is changing. The old systems are breaking down. And we haven't really got a new way of living yet because we are going to become telepathic we are going to become one in terms of our abilities and our ways of being I truly believe that and we will have awakened consciousness I do think that's what humanity is heading towards mm. and when we feel that density or when we feel that that shadow side or that negativity what is for you the best way to deal with that Well, uh, for me, there would be shamanic practices in terms of clearing that energy out so one can breathe it out. In fact, a very simple, really easy way it is we create tension in the body through holding on to things. So just breathing in from one place and exhaling from another can release tension. So, for example, a really simple, tiny little practice I recommend to clients is to imagine breathing in through the crown of their head and exhaling through the soles of their feet. Mm. Just inhale and exhale through the soles of the feet three times. And that will actually create a wave that just shifts tension out of the body really simply. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk of what happens at dream time or at night time. I mean, we dream, we all dream, right? Even though if we don't remember, we dream. But what what really go, goes on I mean, the, in, at that moment? Is there different kind of dreams or different levels of conscious dreams? Or can we even time travel or travel during our dreams? What is that whole, it seems there's many different layers, there's many possibilities in that space. Exactly. Everything you've just said. <laughs> um, there is no absolute definitive answer to what you've just said. It's a topic that is so vast and so nebulous mm -hmm. and so intangible. And, you know, the thing is, with all our advanced technology and all our incredible Um, abilities on this planet to research and do all sorts of things, still that the only way you can tell if someone's dreaming is to wake them up and ask them. <laughs> you know, even with, yes, they can put the monitors on and they can see when somebody's gone into rapid eye movement, um, you know, part of sleep, which denotes the dream part of sleep, but still they've got to actually wake them up and say, what were you dreaming? Uh -huh. So it's fascinating, isn't it? Because it, it is one of those great untapped, resources and we have only just we only started doing research into dreams in the 1950s so it's a relatively young research uh body and that's because paper became cheap then because obviously they're monitoring the brain patterns and reams of paper going through an ecg machine was very expensive until paper became cheap in the 50s and that's when they started doing dream research so we are very young on what we really know about dreams and I think a great deal more will come into being in the future there are some quite extraordinary advances I mean there are research projects being done for example I can't remember who was doing this but where they're now actually creating a database of all the dream symbols and all the you know actually documenting and inviting people to log in and put their dreams into a giant dream database so we start to see patterns evolving and things of that nature but for me I think dreams are a bit more personal I think they are ways that we can time travel. We can definitely, I have had experience of going back into the past and I've had experience of a dream that has come true then subsequently in the future. And it's like suddenly I've been, and I didn't realize at the moment because in the moment the dream also had relevance in the actual moment of now as well in terms mm. of my life. But then 
I don't know, some years later, I was thinking, oh my God, this is that dream. I'm living it. This is this is it. <laughs> and it literally, and I think a lot of people have had that experience when they're suddenly in a situation, they're going, I've dreamt this. This is a dream I've had. So yeah, there is a precognitive aspect to dreams. There's a prophetic quality. One of the things that I've researched in my uh, dream circles that it appears that menopausal women, and it must be something to do with the hormonal shift. And I do think um, hormonal shifts do seem to have some input into the dreams like for example women often before their period will have very violent dreams they'll dreams of um being attacked and lots of blood or an animal attacking them being ripped apart and seeing lots of blood and then they'll wake up and they started to bleed that kind of thing and similarly menopausal women get a lot more prophetic and have a lot more precognitive prophetic dreams during that change in their life and for me I think for women it's when we come into our power it's when the kundalini rises and we really come into our wisdom unfortunately it's not recognized but it is our wisdom years and that is perhaps why suddenly we are able to access a different dimension of knowing. Because if you think in indigenous cultures, the, what, the elders were respected. It's the elders that had the wisdom and they had the power to have the visions to see what was going to happen to their tribe and their community in the future. You know, was the white man going to come and wipe them out? Were they going to be attacked by some, you know, tribe that was after their land or whatever? And so that power of the human as, as we get older to get wiser is also inherent in the dreamscape. Mm. So there, I don't think there's a definitive answer. I think they're multifunctional. Yeah. It's interesting to see that the, the, the ancient civilization, I mean, totally were using dreams. I mean, this is, was very, very important and they, they would really look at it, huh? whereas we totally dismiss it. More than that, they had entire temples dedicated mm. to dreams, the most famous of which, which is um, off the mainland of Greece, uh, Epi, Epidur. Yeah, I can't remember what it is now, Asclepius. And he was the dream god and he had a whole temple dedicated to him. And literally when the doctors had failed, like, for example, if you were sick, physically sick if the doctors had failed couldn't cure you whatever you would spend your life savings so this wasn't a small thing your life savings going on a pilgrimage to a dream temple mm -hmm. when you got to the dream temple of course they were always cited in places of natural beauty you would have hydrotherapy baths you would learn how to meditate you would be given a detox diet you know so you would be played beautiful music taught beautiful things yeah sounds great but you think about it we do have a similar kind of idea when we go to health spas today so some of this ancient wisdom has kind of you know filtered through in different ways but what would happen is you were only allowed in the inner dream incubator when you had the same dream as one of the priests running the temple now what are the chances of that for a start so this shows again an interesting dream phenomena that you can and i've i'm going to come back to an experiment that's good fun to try with a friend So you'd have the same dream because think about it, you spent your life savings, but you only get one night in the inner dream sanctum. I mean, you do not want that to be the night that you go, oh, I don't know. I didn't remember my dream. <laughs> I, I checked out. Yeah. No idea what my dream was. You're going to want to remember that one. So you get very well prepared for it. And certainly if anyone's ever done a detox diet or done anything like that, you, that you find your dreams become a lot more vivid mm -hmm. after a few days of detox. Everything becomes way more vivid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As we clear our system out. And there are extraordinary great engravings on stone tablets outside these temples with the documented evidence of what happened. So real dream healings. Now, in those times, they believed the god Asclepius came in through the dream and healed the person. And there was a lovely story of one guy. He'd had a, a, a wound in his um, chest from a septic arrowhead. And he'd got, obviously got, you know, by modern terms, he'd got septicemia, but he was very, very sick. Nothing had been happened. And in the dream temple, he literally felt the god Asclepius come and take this arrowhead from his chest and the next day all the fever had gone, all the septicemia had gone, he was healed and he survived and it's documented. So extraordinary stories of real healing through our dreams. And of course, Hippocrates, you know, um, Hippocrates, who was the father of modern medicine, he actually in his first books, he wrote about the power of dreams and he suggested doctors ask their patients what they were dreaming. And this is one of the things that I think is incredibly powerful of dreams, but really difficult to bring into reality in our current way of living. Because the unconscious often knows what's wrong with the body before the conscious mind has woken up to the fact. So we often get early health warnings mm. through our dreams. Mm. But often these health warnings are so early, the physical symptoms may literally not have shown up yet. So it's very difficult to go to your doctor and go, well, doc, had this dream, 
you know, had some spots in the marmalade pot and it was on my right lung or the, 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 the ant was pointing to a place on my body and I think there's something wrong with it. You know, you're just going to get locked up, aren't you? And that's so sad because I've you know, when I was researching for the book, there was extraordinary stories of people that had gone on to develop cancer when finally it had been picked up that had dreamt about it months before and perhaps they would not have been so sick, perhaps they could have had preventative medicine by then. Um, and yet we can't obviously get that heard by our doctors because our doctors don't pay attention to dreams and they dismiss that. We've become so rational, so Newtonian in our way of thinking that and it's just, and it's not that I think we should just pay attention to dreams either. I think allopathic medicine has a great role. It's done its own work, but it is about bring, marrying the two. It is about having a more holistic approach again and not throwing the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing that's happened. So health is a massive thing. So I would suggest to viewers, if you ever get a dream that really feels related to your physical body one of the best ways to do that is ask for another dream and go okay how do I deal with it mm -hmm. how do I bring myself back to health what do I need to know and maybe you'll dream of a particular food substance or a lifestyle habit or something you know you need to give up so actually ask your dream for the answer too yeah uh, I've I've been more and more intuitively, and I guess I'm not the only one because it, when I feel something, I feel there's other people, and we're a whole sure. bunch of people yeah. feeling this way. Like recently, it's been I'm closing my eyes before going to bed, and I'm asking for a healing or detoxifying, or you know, I feel that there is help on the other side. And, and at nighttime, there's something that can happen to this extent. Is it is it possible from your shamanic perspective that we can receive that if we're open at nighttime, all of us? I don't think we have to just do it in nighttime. I think we can do that in daytime yeah, too. Yes. But yes, possibly easier. But the mental is yes, all. I know. Mm -hmm. When we let go of our ego mind, but it is also what happens chemically in the body during dream sleep. And we go through five phases of sleep. And the first one or two, it's very um, light wave sleep. We're just in a very light trance. If someone came in or disturbed us or there was a noise, we would wake up very quickly and easily. And it's, it's interesting because it's where hypnosis comes from, that very light trance. And it's called the um, hypnagogic state. So hypno, the god of sleep, Greek god of sleep. So it's how we go into that. And you can often have hallucinations just in that light early phases of sleep. And then we go into the third and fourth phase, which is deep wave sleep and slow. That's when with the real physical healing, cellular healing on the body takes place. Our blood pressure reduces, our pulse comes down, all the systems and the organs in the body slow down to allow the cellular healing. And we're out for the count. I mean, you know, you could have a crisis going on outside and you wouldn't wake up you're out and then it's the last stage which is dream sleep yeah. it's only a very short space and it increases as the night goes on so at the beginning of the night we only get 10 minutes of dream sleep and by morning by the time it's cycled around four or five times that's increased to about 30 40 minutes of dream sleep but it's very interesting our physiology completely changes so suddenly we've gone from deep relaxation deep slow wave deep breathing hardly the body systems they wake up so pulse rate speeds up blood pressure speeds up that's you know increases the blood supply to the brain and the body really speeds up you're on full bodied alert and here's another interesting thing which brings a whole new meaning to i've got a headache darling um because both men and women during dream sleep are fully physically sexually stimulated right but of course, you're also paralyzed because all your major muscles, so you don't act out your dreams. It's like lying there ready to go, but can't actually move. <laughs> so one wonders. I always, I'm like, God, that's a really interesting little joke. Now, why did you design us like that? Because I really think, you know, what is that about? Really, isn't it? Interesting. Yeah, it is an interesting, not well-known fact, but it's true. And it's fascinating because desire is a real key component of dreaming. And if the part of your brain that governs desire is taken away, you will not dream. Yet, if you take away the part of your brain that covers rapid eye, you know, the actual part that covers dream sleep, you still dream. So desire is key to dreaming. And if you think about it, that sexual energy that stimulates is about desire. You know, we desire each other in a sexual way, but it's anything that's why the creative element of dreams, the, what you're talking about, can we travel, can we get help? Yes, if the desire is there. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Anything you have a strong intention or desire for, you will receive in your dreams without doubt, because that's what dreams actually respond to, desire. And in a sense, it's like our daytime dreams. Mm. If we have a big dream, it comes true in relation to the strength of our desire for it. What's our intention? What's our magnetism? What's our attraction that we're putting out for that? Our nighttime dreams work in a very similar way. Mm. So desire is key. Can we say that life is a dream? Can we say that this lifetime is a dream on some extent? All of it's a dream. Yeah. I mean, from a shamanic perspective, we are living a dream. This is, you know, and one day we're going to wake up. Now, I have done a lot of uh, shamanic plant medicines um, out in Peru and things like that. And of course, you do very lucidly enter other dimensions then. And that's when you really get to see that this is a dream. Mm. And that there are many other worlds. Mm. And suddenly, you know, this level of reality, but the fact that I can relay these conversations, you know, I can relay my experiences to you is because we have full consciousness within the experience. And, but the normal, so-called normal, what we see reality, and it's like the veil is taken away and what is really here is revealed. Mm. So you would, for example, in this room, we would be surrounded by beings. Mm. What is what are the steps to you you know that you see or know that to expand that consciousness and to be more and more conscious and see more and more or participate more and more or be co-creating at a whole other level? Meditation is is a real key. Um, if if you're not going to go, I mean, I don't recommend plant medicines to everybody. I think it's a it's not everybody's journey. It happens to be mine and some other people's. I'm not against them, but I mean, I think they're amazing. But I don't think it's for everyone. And I think many paths lead to Rome. So all spiritual practices, to a degree, will get to you to that place. So meditation is a simple, good key one. It's spending time with self. It's spending time really letting go. Um, I think that's an absolute key component. And there was something else came in. Sometimes that happens. It's like a moth goes through my brain. It came in and it went out again. <laughs> it we'll might come right back in at the right back. moment. <laughs> it might come back, but it's not going to come back in this moment. There was something about that. That happens to me with the questions. Yeah, with dreaming. What, here's a very powerful. I was taught this by a guy called Bergs, um, who's an absolute brilliant meditation master. And He taught to actually wake up around three, four in the morning and to meditate yourself back into sleep, mm. to practice lucid dreaming, to really be able to decide where you go in your dreams. And he also suggested that you practice working through your chakras as gates or entry points into dream worlds. So, for example, your sacral chakra is where we tend to hold our emotional pain body, you know, the boyfriend that dumped us or when we got hurt or our parents weren't nice to us and all those bad things that happened. They all knocked in there. And it's what the vagus nerve ends there. And it's what happens when we meditate. We start to unknot all those emotional tangles. And that's why it sort of bubbles up and out. But you could, for example, you sit, you meditate on your sacral chakra. You can go into orange as the color of the sacral chakra. You, I'm sure many viewers have an understanding of the chakra. So you can know what your relationship with that chakra is. And you literally focus your attention on there. And you just go through meditation. You lucidly go into a dream sleep. And that increases the potential of having a lucid dream and really then being able to work with and manage your energy through the dreamscapes in a much more lucid way. Also, the dream, you might fall into a more normal dream through that process and if you do again you've got context because when you wake up and record your dream you know it came from your sacral chakra mm -hmm. so it's going to have associations with that emotional body whereas you know your solar plexus would have associations with your will your heart with your heart issues etc so that's a powerful way to become more aware more conscious more lucid but really You know, life is more simple than we make it often. <laughs> And I love the shamanic way of work because the shaman doesn't push life. Mm. And I suppose if I was to give a metaphor of life from a shamanic perspective, it's to go more with the flow and the rhythm of how the world works. We, you know, it's like the shaman gets in the canoe in the river and he just sits in the canoe and does a bit like paddling and goes downstream with the flow of the river. Most of us in the West, we're wearing ourselves out, exhausting ourselves, desperately paddling upstream, getting nowhere mm. fast. And that is just like, oh, let go, let the flow. And it's, for example, we do so many things that are sort of in a sense counterintuitive to the way nature works. And nature's always the greatest teacher. 
just looking, watching nature, observing nature and working with its rhythms. It's like we tend to want to set New Year's resolutions on the 1st of January. It's nonsense. No wonder they will fail and everyone's given up by the second week. Because the earth, the earth beneath your feet is dead then. Mm. It's asleep. It's hibernating. So it's not a time to start a new regime or get rid of old habits. You've got no impetus. You've got no support to help you do that. You're really having to do that as a pure act of will. And we all know what happens when anything is done through sheer will. There is at some point when it becomes the diet <laughs> or the <laughs> and we come off that path because will only takes us so far. Yeah. Yet. If we waited till February, Chinese New Year, then the land or the earth beneath our feet, the sap's beginning to rise. The earth's woken up. It's got potent energy because it's going to spring into action any minute. So, my God, if you start your New Year's resolution then and you've got your new regime then, you've got so much earth support behind you to help you take that forward. Mm. So I've never just, heard that before. That's cool. That, yeah, but that's how it works. And then you're going to have success. Yeah. So really think, where is... Uh, the earth where do I live what's the season yeah. am I in winter then I'm not going to start a new project I'm going to go and hibernate for a bit and just let it be and percolate my creativity and see what's inside me and meditate a bit more mm -hmm. and then I'll wait till spring and get ready for the launch then though I find that winter is a great time to write yeah, or to very creative yeah. but but writing is an insula right It's an in, you know, you may put your book out in the world ultimately, but you wouldn't put the book out in winter. Mm -hmm. In the winter, it's a perfect time for writing because yeah. it's you and the words yeah. and it's you and your own psyche and the dream world and the spirit world and all of that. So, yeah. Beautiful. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Is there a, a last uh, little, um, I, I love, I love what you just said about you know, going through the seasons and really just listening more and being kind of in, uh, uh, in, 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 in being sy not synchronistic, but in uh, sync in synergy with the, with the planet, with Gaia. Mm -hmm. um, last little word of wisdom for us. Yes. <laughs> I take a lesson from the tree. In terms of, you asked me about how do we get to be more authentic? How do we get to be more fully here? And it's like the tree. Own the tree sovereignty. The tree does not go, oh, I'll just move my roots over here. Have a bit more space bush. Oh, I'll just bring my branches in. Here, have some more light flowers. The tree goes, no, I'm having everything I can get. Thank you very much. But it doesn't do it in an aggressive way or an attacking way. It just is. Just be everything you are. Allow your magnificence to be like the tree. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Davina. Real <laughs> pleasure to be here. Thanks, Lila. Big, big kisses, my juicy co-creators. Hope you have enjoyed this interview. Please share it wildly, abundantly. Big, big kisses to all of you from England. Bye-bye. Yeah.